I first got familiar with the word stain through watching surf washing powder commercials as a kid. The things it was associated with in those commercials made it so light-hearted, upbeat and even fun. Even today, they still do speak of stain with so much color, sunshine, rainbows and roses. After all, the worst thing stain could be is a faint mark of mud that could be cleared off a white t-shirt with just one wash, right? No big deal. But then I read Dambuzo Marichira's House of Hunger in college. And that book, that f book. But today, please, we will not be censoring because it will definitely rob the video of its entire meaning. So as they say in the news, be warned because you may find the subject matter of this video very disturbing. So if you're a sensitive viewer, look out, look out world, risque adult material will be discussed. So buckle up. Anyway, as I was saying, I never looked at that word the same way ever again after reading the book because House of Hunger presented the word in a whole new light, or should I say darkness. Fellow legendary Zimbabwean writer Doris Lessing even said the book felt like it was written in a single breath, which kind of makes sense, right? Because when you write something in a single breath, it's very unlikely you will get the time to filter out your twisted mind as raw and nasty as your thoughts may be. And that's pretty much the house of hunger there. It's all up in your face with, it, with its very obscene and unapologetic imagery, characters and scenes and descriptions. You see, nigger girls are just meat. And I don't like my meat raw. Of course, it's something else when a man is starving for pussy. <laughs> Shit. That's it, man. Sway it out of your system. It does a man good to swear. This highly exorbitant use of profanity does serve a literal purpose that gives the book substance, which kind of makes it kind of beautiful. Yes, you heard me. It is beautiful. As written by my fellow comrade, we call the silence it only in his dissertation, the aesthetics of vulgar in 2018, it argues that the choice of employing vulgar is not that he is an antisocial delinquent, although he totally was, it is that vulgar can express what cannot be clearly expressed by euphemized and normal words and actions, thus it becomes artistic. All this is meant to outline Marichira's nihilistic ideas of African hopelessness or as they call it, Afro-pessimism. And today we will explore just how he does it with his obscenity and risque literal devices. In a way, his detailed description of sex, masturbation, urination, defecation, blood, violence, waste and rape is meant to express something that could have been lost if he beat around the bush with euphemisms. So the novella begins with the first person narrator who is an anti-hero who sort of whines and whines and whines about how he is trapped but then runs away from the house of hunger where he quote couldn't have stayed because every morsel of sanity was snatched from him the way some kinds of birds snatch fruit away from the mouths of babes. Although I don't know what that means. Through really random flashbacks, memories, anecdotes and conversations with friends in the beer hall on the day of his departure. The narrator paints a harrowing picture of his childhood youth and adulthood while growing up in the township of a colonized nation in the colonized Rhodesia of the 1960s to 70s which he calls the house of hunger. According to Sitole, the book's famous title does not refer only to the literal starvation which was ravaging pre-independent Zimbabwe at the time, rather it implies a far more reaching and metaphorical hunger of the soul, the passive yearning and emptiness within the national consciousness aspiring for more but held back by poverty and corruption. And the way it describes these issues with so much over the top liberal vulgar and lewdness, Mangea in 2014 correctly believes that vulgarity is generally associated with delinquency and antisocial behavior and studies associated with it have suffered long and unnecessary neglect and yeah Dambuza Marechra to be fair was was a delinquent who exhibited high tendencies even extreme tendencies of antisocial behavior who sure loved his shits and f-bombs but in this book his vulgarity does serve a deeper purpose most of classic English literature was known to be classy and sophisticated and only read at tea parties. 
It was a clean form of ancient entertainment than actually proving a political point on social injustices that faced a society. But then the enslaved black folks started writing too. And unlike classic English works from Charles Dickens or Shakespeare, which were born out of culture and leisure, much of black literature was born out of struggle, suffering and discrimination. That's why African literature has often darker themes than classic British literature. This is the ugly reality of occupation, racism, segregation and colonization. And for this reason, many other black legendary authors have been unapologetic when it comes to using really graphic imagery to convey their points and the darkness of racism. Others such as non-violent Bluayo, Richard Wright, Alice Walker and particularly Toni Morrison or the lady who spoke like an angel but wrote like a demon. I mean, just listen to that voice, right? Art forms I wanted to be involved in, and they included dancing. I wanted really to be Maria Tall Chief most of my life. But that's why the book is about men, because when I thought of that idea, I couldn't use women characters to explicate that idea. But this is again the same person who wrote this. Then John E. raped his little child. We call her Brit Love. He saw her in the kitchen. Then like a predator, he went in. And he molested her again and again and again with the sweat bleeding down his face and sadistic body. Okay, maybe she did not write that word for word, but she definitely did write along those lines. I mean, there is a reason they once banned the bluest eye from high school shelves for a significant period of time. According to Achille Pembe in 2001, he defends the modern use of profanity as he believes there is a need to explore how vulgarity is used as a voice of the marginalized rather than prematurely dismissing the writers of vulgar elements in their works. There is also a need to comprehensively examine the literature and its content in relation to the ideas which consider the beauty of vulgarity based on its expression of power and reality. This is what Dambuzo seeks to achieve and executes brilliantly really in this book. Even though he risks putting off some readers with these dirty stories, at least they are authentically powerful. They shove the reader into the serious ugliness of the reality he is trying to portray, while metaphorically giving depth and dimensions to the devastating situation he finds himself in. He is giving immorality and poverty a body. You may not like it, but you respect his honesty. And many scholars have. As you know, House of Anger ranges from being gory to being bloody to just being plain filthy and raunchy. We have Peter who masturbates in front of his siblings, public school hangings, their mother who does her sex work in the same room, her children sleep in, the bloody beating of the narrator's white girlfriend and who could forget that iconic infamous public rape scene, right? Which Marichara argues to be completely factual by the way. Even the way some of these characters talk about each other. As described in the book, when Marichara grows up to be a man is not a place that is appropriate for any child. <laughs> Far from it, Lilford poses that he transforms the colonial allegory of Africa as a degraded body into a new allegory of the township as both the latrine and the degraded mind. The theme of loss of innocence, which is the degraded mind, as a childhood that is quote stained and contaminated with the same violence and melancholy that characterizes the lives of the adults. It is well known in academic circles that House of Hunger symbolizes drought. But Sitole further argues that Marichara's drought is twofold. The first is the familiar rural condition of deprivation of rain, such as in Waiting for the Rain by Charles Mungoshi, and the second is the urban drought which has more to do with the spiritual impoverishment and stains which cannot be washed away because there is no rain. More so, Juarara poses that the township in which Marechera grew up reeks with sex, sadism, rape, masochism, and social anarchy. The township life is a microcosm of the whole society in the country. In the end, it is the woman and the child who become the central victims of this drought. Unlike other African novels which sort of present African natives as saints, House of Hunger does not pick sides as it appears to portray both sides of the dichotomies it examines as vile and disgusting. Both black and white 
both the colonizer and the colonized, both men and women, poor or rich, no one is spared from being described as vile, immoral, obscene, and disgustingly flawed. The black Rhodesian children are contaminated by the behavior of their parents who just don't give a shit about how their behavior and choices affect their children, especially with their sexual activities such as intercourse, rape, or masturbation. Like the narrator's mother's lecture about sex to her son. You stick it in the hole between the water and the earth. It's easy. She splays out her legs. You punch out your pelvis between her thighs and strike right there between her water and her earth. You strike like a fire. She will take you in and your balls in. Things that are traditionally supposed to be private across all cultures across every board are done in broad daylight in House of Anger or right in front of their children's eyes with impunity. We have that public rape scene and Edmund's mother who goes as far as to sleep with one of her son's classmates for money. One day he let it be known that Edmund's mother was a common drunken whore and that he even had screwed her nuts and she had certainly use some of the money to pay for Edmund's fees. A word that is strongly used to represent these disgusting flaws of society is stain. As I said, stain is used a lot in the book. There are stains in the form of dirt, semen, blood, shit, and so much more. Stain symbolizes so much more, such as the metaphor for a destroyed human potential according to Mr. C. Ole. Zimunya deposes that the most vivid thing about sex is stain. The stain is a metaphor of horror, guilt and shame and the moral scene and nausea too we are back at the ubiquitous corruption of all values this climb at the heart of the rhodesian crisis and since there is no metaphorical rain to wash these stains away in house of hunger it means these stains are infinite they cannot be washed away this is where the theme of hopelessness is truly highlighted the traces of immoral sexuality and linger of physical psychological violence which terrorizes the text cannot simply vanish yes like they do in those vanish washing powder commercials the stains become blood stains in the matter of the old man and the richer, semen stains in the matter of the narrator and the prostitute, and shit in the matter of the narrator and the other guy he was talking to in this other time. There's nothing to make you glad for a human being. There's just dead shit and blood. There's just bloody whites and dogs trained to bite us. There's white shit in our history, and white shit on our hands, and in anything we do. As I said before, stain can be seen as contamination on the innocence of children from the township who because of poverty uh, and lack of responsible grown-ups to emulate, they grow up to be immoral drunkards, wife beaters, murderers, rapists and prostitutes like Nesta or Juliet. Many of the characters became become stains themselves that stain others. Peter reduces immaculate to a stain. The African bully Stephen reduces Edmund to a stain and when the narrator finds him in the bathroom there was a stain on his shirt, a rather large stain which seemed to outline the map of Rhodesia. Of course the stain may symbolize the dent that has been put in Africa's way of life past, present and future mainly by colonization. Yeah, it's not an African novel without the themes of imperialism is it? <laughs> Kenyan Gugi Wationgo believes that mental violence is just as damaging as physical violence, if not more. In his classic essay, is called Decolonizing the Mind. But House of Hunger takes it a little further down the gutter with its description of the devastating effects of the white man's coming in African society, which the book boldly personifies as being raped with subtle implications that Africa is stained by the white man's semen and STIs. Yeah, Marechera uses a lot of rape metaphors and gets quite creative with it too. At one point, the nameless narrator refers to his fellow black nationals as whores who have been eaten to the core by the syphilis of the white man's coming. A good example of this syphilis or mental syphilis is in the short story Black Skin White Mask, which dwells on the questions of blackness and identity. A dark pigment that was once our proud blueprint is now seen as an indelible stain by many characters in the novel because of the white man's abrupt 
coming and discrimination. The friend who is never named views his Africanness as a shameful stain which no amount of washing can erase and he surely does try to wash his dark skin off but the only thing he got out of his skin was blood and scars. The motives of shit and defecation surface frequently throughout the novella as well. Marichara seemed to have a weird infatuation with shit and toilets. Like seriously though, he actually has a play named the toilet where there was a lot of shitting and farting and smells and flashing. Yeah, you get the idea. Apart from the notion of white shit, black people and politics in general are considered as well as shit because they do the same corrupt capitalistic discriminatory shit the Rhodesian colonizers used to do. Also, there are several more or less metaphorical visits to the toilet and farting connotations in House of Hunger too. As he writes, I got a paisley, escaping to the toilet just made it to the bar where I was violently sick. As I came out, wiping my mouth with the back of my hand, I collided with two massive breasts that were straining angrily against the thin t-shirt upon which was written Legend Zimbabwe. The linking of vomiting, toilet and strikingly big breasts of Julia the prostitute who is the narrator's cool time friend who is also referred as the beer hole doll nigger whore and the bitch you can't help but feel that this bitch, a grotesque abnormal excessive materiality of a female body is a symbol of Zimbabwe itself. After all, she is wearing that t-shirt written in Zimbabwe, right? Julia's grotesque merchandise body represents Zimbabwe and Rhodesia. It finds the representation in a township woman who has stains of semen dripping down as she walked. Yeah, he actually wrote that. Uh, yes, that's another rape metaphor. As Julia was once a flower full of potential and hope, but now has been deflowered. Kind of like the way Africa was deflowered of its resources in the prime time of colonization. Against its will. You know, like when you, what happens when someone gets raped? It sort of leads us to the point of loss of innocence Comrade Sitole talks about. Even after independence, House of Hunger hints or even directly prophesies that suffering and corruption will prevail since the children who are born into Zimbabwe begin to be corrupted as soon as they breathe their first air because of their explicit exposure to corruption, violence, sex and drugs, especially its angle on the birth of a baby, which is one powerful symbol that is often used in art to reflect a new beginning of hope and unity for most people even in the most tragic of circumstances, such as in Jacques Romain's Masters of the Jew with Manuel and Anais whose pregnancy is seen as a symbol that will unite the two opposing village factions after years of bloody fighting even after Manuel's death. Or oh, the most recently new 2022 Black Panther Wakanda Forever, where T'Challa's secret son with Nakia is seen as a symbol of renewal, continuity, and hope for the Black Panther franchise after the tragic sudden death of Chadwick Boseman in real life. But House of Anger only reduces this glorified moment as just her giving birth is therefore a moment of purity in an otherwise corrupted existence. House of Anger portrays the environment as too shitty like a township toilet to even have hope. As written by Sitole again, for Marechera, birth is still possible as shown by Immaculate and Nesta conceiving children, but the children are born into a dry and dusty world which cannot nourish them. Instead of the children purifying the world, the world depurifies the children. At various moments in the novella, the writer identifies himself as a child in a far world of frightening and savage adults. This new birth of hope is probably an allusion for Zimbabwean independence, but since the baby's future is already fucked up to begin with because of the stained society it is born into, it is clear what Marechera is trying to say about the future in this body of work he wrote in the 20th century. It all foreshadows a Zimbabwean future still filled with suffering, poverty and corruption just like it was in the colonial days but with only new faces that are a little darker. Which leads us to the question of the day. So is this book written in 1978 with all its symbolical pessimism 
Zimbabwism, vulgarity and darkness, is it still relevant until today? Is Zimbabwean independence still worth it up to today? Have we cleaned out these stains? Or are we still living in the house of hunger? Comment below and let me know what you think, guys. Okay, now, you can put these senses back. We're done with this really, really obscene video. Now, that will probably get me in trouble with the YouTube algorithm. I will be in the toilet not to shit, but to wash my mouth with soap because that's the most dirty words I have used in such a short space of time. I feel so dirty, yet kind of sophisticated. I feel like a stain. <laughs> So, as always, guys, thanks for watching the video and watching Mimsy Africa. Until we meet again, thanks for watching, guys. Hi, guys, thanks for watching the video. And as always, I hope you got enlightened. You know, here at Mimsy Africa, we also offer graphic designing and video editing services to anyone around the world through World Remit. The prices are quite reasonable, of course. So if you have a YouTube channel, video, blog, or social media business that may require quality visuals that really make a statement and really engage your audience, Hit us up either here in the comment section or at our Instagram inbox and we can make arrangements there. The link is in the bio. And as always folks, thanks for watching BMC Africa.